So Jason, your your say your base plates and, and items like that are they're made here, is that right? That's right, all your different plates are made here, Bertie. You have your base plates for your columns, you have your end plates for your rafters, you have your cleat plates, any any different types of plates, and the stun in, in a flash is manufactured in this machine here, produced in this machine here. Okay. So from the conveyor, what machine is it going on to first in there? Basically, as you can remember from the earlier on on the drilling line below, you start here with the same same setup again. You have your gripper and it puts your bar straight in and you start then. The first process is it marks the number again on your plate. So it's marking the number, then it punch, punches the plate and then it goes on to cut the plate. Okay. And there are the three processes and you can either punch it or drill it. This boat is on it. You can either use the drill or use the punch. And I see lots of drill heads on that there, is there? That's right, yeah. and also punching. Okay. You can, you can, and you can punch square, oval holes, round holes, or whichever okay. you like. And why wouldn't you just punch everything and, as opposed to drilling? Why would the on certain jobs, uh, punching isn't, uh, isn't allowed on some of the commercial jobs because the actual punch hole can be slightly Hatch angled. On the Yes, yes. Yeah. and the drilled hole is obviously a, a truer hole. Okay. And also sometimes you might want to um, put treads into holes in plates. So you use your drill to drill the, drill the plate and then it'll also tap the hole in the plate as well. What machine does that tap? Or? On this one here. Okay. So, yeah. And then also this machine, what it does, it has a plasma. It has a plasma head on it as well. So if you need to cut any shapes, be it circles or oblongs, or take or the corners off it. Take the corners around the corners on plates. It also does that as well. Are they the dies there for threading or? They're the dies for punching. They're all your punching dies yeah. there. Yeah. And you, you can go all the different sizes right up to the the real big ones, you know. And you're mainly putting them on there, is, is that right? No, it's, well, it's done automatically. Well. It's all done automatically here. Yeah. They're all on that wheel inside the series, of, so it can change whatever punch size you want to put on it then, you know. Okay. That's Very good. Hard. Very impressive. So across the way then, we're looking at angle irons. What all do you need to do then, typically, when you're manufacturing? Basically, again, it's the same as you're going back to your drilling line. It's the same process. You have your gripper. Your, your intake is here, it takes in the angle arms. This machine, unlike this one, it's all drilling. And also, if you want, if you want to, on some bracing, you could have slotted holes. But because it's a drill, most drills don't slot. Yeah. But this machine actually slots the hole as well. It has a separate tooling. So you can put a slotted hole or an oblong hole or even a large circular hole if you want to on this machine it will do all and is the one bit doing that or is it two, no, different, two, two different two different tools? okay two different tooling's inside of it as, as i showed you below i can show you here it's the same it has different it has a cassette with all the different tools inside in the cassette so basically it takes your angle iron in and it takes it in the v-shape like this and onto the conveyor and then the gripper takes it and pushes it through so it does all the drilling and tooling first, and then it chops the angle arm. It's a guillotine. Okay. I can show you here, you can yeah. see. It. You have a drill to drill a hole. A drill will never slot a hole. Yeah. But in this case, this machine can do both. Most of the time you punch this hole, but in this particular machine it has a tooling. As you can see, it's 100%. Yeah, and why did that? That's a different size to that. Then is that there's obviously a reason for that. Them two holes, that could be a 14 mil. I'd say that's a 12 mil. Pen's coming off the draw, and what's yeah, it's the, doing? And it's a structural engineer specking that then. Exactly. Okay. And then you have two ordinary holes. It's probably bolted into a column, and that's the slotted hole probably for a purl line or a rail. And what to give flexibility to the erector? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it is, and there's a, there's a load of different reasons. And industrial commercial buildings, you could have a firewall. And in a firewall situation, all the holes have to be slatters. For if there was a expansion. fire inside in the building, there has to okay. be expansion. Yeah. So basically then, and if you remember on this, you had your numbers. Look. And that's here. <clears throat> yeah. That number now will match the drawn for the erectors. And they know where to put this fleet on. Yeah. Great traceability. Traceability is the whole thing. It is, yeah. in food and steel. Food and steel, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So basically, you can see it here. Yeah. 
your angle iron machine is coming in, it's doing its drills, it has two drills, one at both sides, and whether it's milling or drilling, it's, it's working from e each side at the same time. And it comes through then, and here at the front, there's a guillotine type system that cuts the angle iron at whatever length or whatever it requires to be cut, at whatever angle it requires to be cut. That machine there is what they call a clad by. Basically what it does is, typically if you see your roofs on a building or sides of a building, to be more used on commercial work rather than agricultural work, where you'd have uh, insulated panel sheets. And basically where you'd have a pitch in a roof, you can lift the sheet with these, these suction pads, catch the sheet, it fold, the machine folds out, obviously, and it catches the sheet, and you can lift the sheet at whatever angle you want. So if you have the pitch of the roof is 10 degrees, it can lift the sheet at 10 degrees and it drops the sheet straight onto the roof. And on the sides of a building then, it can turn the sheet vertically or horizontally. Yeah. And basically they're just putting the sheet in. It's hanging from your crane on site. So okay. it just makes life it's easier. It's a dangerous job without something like that, basically, you could imagine. Exactly. With a sheet at wrong angles. Now you have it. And also like where you can, side sheets where you can be vertical, it is fair. So it's, it's not too bad to lift vertical sheets, but where you sheets horizontally yeah. laid on a building, yeah. it's very hard for the guys to lift them. You couldn't lift them manually. Like. And it's not magnetic, it's all suction. Exactly. Yeah. And, and most commercial or industrial jobs are way higher than your average agricultural jobs. So you could be up 12 metres and you're trying to put a sheet onto a building. It just makes the whole thing safer, you know? Yeah, so that's your guillotine. So that's your guillotine there now. The lads are putting in the sheet. That sets whatever, whatever, whatever which you want to cut it. The machine will, they just set up the machine and it will repeatedly cut the sheets to whatever which you yeah. want for. Very hard to do it any other way with a clean cut. Handy trolley. Yeah, it is, at least it takes over because if you 26 of them, they can be quite heavy, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of handling on them. So this is creating the angle then? Yes. He's setting up now to where to... He's setting the machine up to, to start now, so he, he can set up the angle to whatever machine fold whatever angle you want. And it tells you which, which fold to do first. It does all that itself. Because the sequence of folds have to be done right. Or you could fold it, if you fold it wrong, you wouldn't be able to fold the last fold, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So depending on the shape of it. See, it comes out, fold it. Is that a cap or sort there or not? That's, that's obviously a ridge cap for a building. Okay. Jason, you, you were on about the machine for lifting the inside, the panel inside, so it's Kingspan, is it? Yeah, basically, most of the time, so this Kingspan panel you're using, and um, that actual panel you're looking at there is actually, it's the panel that is laid horizontally. That actual particular, that's, that's just sitting in stock there for a job ready to go out now, you know. But you can get the panel then at all different thicknesses. Yeah. It could be up to double the thickness of some of those panels. Yeah. And they can be quite heavy like. So each sheet is lifted with a crane. Okay. And put into situ, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't supply the crane, it's just supply oh, we the, do, yeah. the device? Oh, like, it's crane, the yeah, whole album. It's part of your yeah. job erecting yeah. the whole, yeah. It is indeed. But again, more commercial jobs as opposed to culture. Exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Jason, the, the last process, Sophia, is, is painting. That's right, yeah. yeah. So I see the big lift door again. Hydraulic doors, yeah. We love them. We have four of them here, so we have in this case. So it's a part for air, you were saying, I think, uh, for, it's, it, for in the hot. In, in, in here, we'll say, if you were to open, we, what we find, in, especially like in our summer times, or if you had a dry day in the winter, it's, it's actually one of the best ways to dry paint is fresh air and to get airflow through a building, rather than trying to heat buildings and, you know. So we find that when we are designing this, we open the whole front of the building up with the hydraulic door system. And also, that building is um, 7.5 metres, so to six metres high doors. So it also gives you six metres of a canopy. It, it, it often happens that you could have long trusses or long beams. Like that, that building there is 26 meters deep, but you'd, you'd, you'd be at your limit sometimes if there was stuff in the building. Or the thing about painting, when you have stuff in it, paint is wet, you have to hit the process till it dries yes. before you can actually handle it, you know, before you can take it out. Because I don't know, people, 
you don't realise nowadays that, that, that the emphasis that's on paint as opposed to before, you know, it's a big, big part of agricultural and commercial jobs, like, is the paint spec. What percentage of jobs get painted and uh, what percentage get galvanised? Well, funny enough, as you're here now, this actual job here is actually, um, it was uh, fabricated and, and, and galvanised and, and has actually been painted over the galvanising. But as a percentage, like the question you asked, I'd say probably 30% of, to 40% of agricultural jobs get galvanised. Probably only 10% of more of the um, commercial jobs get galvanised. Depending on the environment they're going to, okay. it's really the, the key to you know, whether they are or they are not. But in this one, this is actually, um, it's a cantilever building and it's actually open. So it is open to the elements all year round. So for that reason, the client asked us to galvanize it first. And then, and then paint. it's painted with actually the same spec as agricultural building is painted with the MIO yeah. that's for yeah. specified for the grant approved buildings. Okay. You know, so it's really going to last the test of time then? Oh, it is a course. It's yeah. got an itch primer of, I think, like 60 microns. It's got an MIO primer of 50 microns and it has a finish top coat of 50 microns. So there's, I think there's 125 microns of paint on top of a galvanized, but it's, it, it's a slow process to do because when the stuff comes back from galvanizers, it's, it's to be washed with a special liquid, and then it also has to be washed with water, washed down, taken back into the paint shop and dried, and, and then you start your process of, of your three coats of paint. And like, as you can see, there's, a, there's, there's quite a bit in it, like, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's your, say, your painting process in itself, so you've someone there at it there now, it's all compressed air driven, is it all? They're, they're, all, they're all airless sprayers. It's, it's, they're pumped from, the, from, from, from the, the machine over here, you can hear it running over. Okay. It's actually pumping the paint straight through the pipe. There's no, you're, you're listening to actually the paint coming out of the gun, not yeah, air. You don't have any receiving jar no. or whatever, yeah. That no, no, but on the old guns, you have two pipes coming to the, you had a air pipe and a paint pipe. Okay. So the paint was sucked with the air. The air was driving the paint. This isn't, this is a pump, pumping the paint through a hose. So there's nothing coming to the head of the gun, only paint. Okay. The noise you hear is actually the paint coming out of the gun. It's not air that you're listening to. Right, okay. yeah. So back to an agricultural job again, would it, how many coats of paint after you get, or shot blast to see comes in here, how many coats of paint would it typically get? Um, on an agricultural job, you'll be, you'll, you'll start with your shot blast to beam. You'll be putting on, they only ask for like 40, microns, we'll say in the grant specification job, the astral 40, on that 40 in the first primer you'll get up to 70 on it and then you give it 25 or 50 microns of the MIO primer and then also you finish it then with your 50 of the overcoat. So you, they want 125 but if you, if you tested any of those there you'd be always on the strong side of that, you could be up to 170 microns, okay. do you know. So, but then, it, that's no problem applying. The big, big, biggest job we have at the moment, we don't have any of it in there at the moment, but is, is uh, intermittent paint. What's that? On the commercial jobs, there's a fireproofing paint that has to go onto the steelwork. And depending on the size of the steel, different amounts of it, like. But where you're talking here of 125 microns required, it could be getting up to 1,200, 1,500, in one instance, we had 1,800 microns of paint that had to go onto a beam. So you're talking like six mil of paint to go on over. And what's as far as fire is protecting the steel from fire. Again, to be used in commercial buildings quite a lot. Okay. And there used to be a time when commercial buildings were erected and then the fireproofing paint was, the intermittent paint was applied on sites. But with environmental requirements that you can't do that anymore. It has to be applied in the paint shop okay. and it has to go out. But the problem, as you can realize, if six mil of paint, you have to load it onto a lorry yeah. and you have to stack paint, it's, it's very, very hard. Yeah. And what that takes is time. It takes like, it could take up to, it's like anything. It, it, the longer it can get, the better for curing, you know what I mean? Because what you don't need out in the site is beams all marked then, you know. So. so how long would it take for uh, paint to dry typically then after say that spraying is done, how long is it then? We'd, we'd always give it the day yeah. before we'd shift it, do you know? We'd always give it the day minimum. But like, 
if you didn't, it's not actually the problem. The paint will still dry, but the problem is you'll mark all the paint. Like, and you know, you don't want a product going out on site that clients are paying good money for and it all marked. And what happens, your guys erecting then have slings. The slings for erecting the crane, they're going to mark it. And you know, every day that it can get, and it doesn't matter, it can be touched dry after, I can tell you what the guy was painting there, if I touch that in two hours, it'll be touched dry. But if you put a forklift on that, you're going to mark it. Or uh, when it goes to a size, put on slings in it. Most of that steel there, it'll be erected on Friday. So today is Wednesday. So like, you'll be given it, it'll have the rest of today, all day tomorrow, and loaded tomorrow evening for Friday to be delivered to site. And as you mentioned, erections, say, of the sheds, do you, is it on a contract or do you have your own teams? We have our own teams. Everyone, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't contract in any erectors. We, we have all our own erectors. I know at times, it's, in your busy times, you'd say you might need more. Quite at times, you might need less. But we have the same erectors with years now, and the good team of lads. And yeah, they're used to it. They work well. The customers happy. That's the main thing. And and like, as well as the lads, all the lads here, they're all great lads. Every one of them. I couldn't say much, yeah. enough about him. Yeah as much as they have to fabricate the steel and get it out and it has to be right, the erector has just as big a job to do. Yeah. And, and bigger in, in instances, bigger yeah. because it can be awkward. Like. And those, they're completely different roles as such, are they? Completely different roles, completely different lads. You might cross them over if you're busy, you know, but generally it's the erectors are out all the time, you know, and like, you know yourself with the country we live in, you're against the elements, the weather all the time and, you know, it's tough going, but sure. It's part of the job, yeah, as I said. It's a sequel to it, I presume. Oh, yeah. definitely, yeah. indeed, yeah, indeed, yeah, indeed. Yeah.